Hey everyone, and welcome to the podcast for December first already. Uh, as always, I'm Avery Pelch, editor in chief of Tom's Hardware, and I'm joined by Raspberry Pi expert Ash Puckett, uh, associate editor Les Pounder is off today, and we have a very special guest, Nathan Trelaw from uh, from the UK, who uh, who does some really amazing things with LED matrices. Nathan, can you tell everyone about yourself? Uh, what you do, um, you got started with Pi? Yeah, sure. So so I'm actually a PhD student at University College London, um, in London, in the UK, obviously. Um, yeah, so I basically got involved with it during lockdown. So our lockdown started in March. Um, and I kind of always, you know, the Raspberry Pi kind of always interested me because, um, you know, it's a cool little computer that you can do stuff with. So I kind of always wanted an excuse to buy one. And then I can't remember how I found out about the matrices, uh, but when I saw those, I thought they looked really cool. And then I'm also interested in these things called cellular, cellular automata. Um, and I can explain a bit more what those are in a bit. Um, but basically the matrices are the perfect thing to implement those on. So kind of all those three things came together with the lockdown. And I was like, you know, I might as well just jump in now and uh, uh, see what I can do. What is a cellular automata? Um, yeah, so they are these kind of, um, it's, it'll be a lot easier to explain when I can show you, it'll make a lot more sense, but they're, they're these kind of, um, sort of almost mathematical objects where you have say a grid of cells and those cells can be either dead or alive. And the state of each cell depends on basically what its neighbors are doing. So there's very simple rules that dictate what a cell is going to do based on what its neighbors are doing. And basically out of those simple rules, you get really interesting, complex global behavior. Uh, so they've always really interested me. And then um, I can show you a few of them actually on the LED matrix itself. Yeah, show, show us. Uh, yeah, so show let's show us. So I have a potential live demo. Well, I can live demo basically the main bit of the project. So if I just turn you around. And then I also have some videos of some other stuff if you want to see those as well. So can you oh, see yeah. that properly? Yes. So, That's pretty um, true. Oh, yeah. So, so that was another lockdown um, purchase as well, which happened slightly after uh, the Raspberry Pis. Um, so I actually printed, <laughs> yeah, so I actually printed this this case, which is holding everything. That looks so good. I designed, oh. yeah, designed that on CAD. What uh, type so of part, 3D printer is that, by the way? Uh, it's, it's an Ender 3 Pro. Oh, neat. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very cool. So I, yeah, you so have to I look it off CAD. to print next. <laughs> yeah, so I learned CAD basically uh, to make this at first and then I've been doing some other stuff as well. So, um, yeah, so this is basically it. There's a Raspberry Pi 4 in the bottom um, and kind of all the wiring. So I have the Adafruit hat, which makes the wiring really easy. Easy. So it's basically just, uh, you just got to connect two power supplies, one for the Raspberry Pi and one for the matrix in the back. Um, and then, yeah, we obviously got this simple menu here. So um, I'll just show you some of these cellular, cellular automata. So this first one is called the game of life. So you can see how we've got this grid of cells and they're doing some like crazy stuff, right? Um, and basically you have simple rules, which dictates what each cell is going to do based on what its neighbors are doing. And then out of this, we get kind of this emergent complex behavior. Um, so obviously these look really cool on the matrix, I think. Um, yeah, so this is the game of life. Um, which was kind of invented by John Conway, who unfortunately died during the corona pandemic. But um, yeah, he's a really famous mathematician and did some really cool stuff. Um, and then we have some some of these other ones. So this is one um, of Stephen Wolfram's cellular automata. So he, he's done a lot of work with these. And he's doing some crazy stuff, trying to basically derive physics from one of these objects sort of thing. So um, that's really cool. So if you're interested in that, look up the uh, Wolfram physics project because it's very, if he's uh, if he's right, it's going to be very cool stuff. And then we've got some other ones. So this is slightly different. So we have like a little ant that's kind of moving around. And what the ant does is based on the color of the square. So it can lay down kind of these tracks and it will basically um, sort of move outwards, putting stuff down. And then, um, this last one is cool because we have, so it's kind of hard to see on the webcam. So the webcam doesn't do this justice at all. Um, but um, you can see we have these uh, kind of square objects that are kind of replicating themselves. 
Um, and these, um, basically John Newman did a lot of work uh, with these and he um, likes, so to try and find sort of the minimal set of attributes that a self-replicating machine would need. And he sort of almost derived molecular biology before we knew how it worked, which I think is really cool, just from looking at these simple cellular automata-like objects. So you can see it's kind of replicating itself. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I could talk for ages about those, but I know that's kind of not the point of the podcast. Um, yeah, so. No, that's very than, interesting. Yeah, so they're very cool. Yeah, the last cool one, things. I had a quick question. I noticed that as it was expanding outward, it kind of wrapped around the edge and started to expand oh, yeah. on the other side. Did you have to like program it to do that? Did you set all of that up entirely? Yeah, yeah, so say. I programmed all of this from scratch in C++. Uh, yeah, so it's just got looping boundary conditions. So if something goes off the edge, it'll come back around here. And if it goes off the edge here, it'll come back around the bottom. Um, yeah, and then something maybe something maybe a bit less sort of out there. We've just got some uh, some games here. So we've got Snake. Um, so we all know how Snake works. Um, so it's kind of hard to play and talk at the same time. So yeah, and I have this little controller here, which is how I'm controlling all of this. If you can see that here. Um, so you see, how is got, that um, programmed? Is that C C plus plus also, or is it Pygame? Yeah, uh, no. So yeah, all of this is C plus plus. So it's the same app. Um, yeah, so it's one C plus plus app basically. Um, so we've got Tetris, and then the controller. I had to use um, something called libfdev to get like the inputs and basically write the driver for the controller. Um, so we've got Tetris as well, um, which is obviously quite familiar to everyone. So, you know, you can get lines. Um, and then we go at the score and your high score. Um, so we all know how Tetris works. I have a question. Um, whenever I was yeah, looking cool. at the code for this on your GitHub yeah. page, um, you mentioned that this was mainly designed for the 64 by 64 matrices, but is it difficult to adjust it um, to work with the 32 by 64? Not really. So I actually had, so I actually started out on a 32 by 64, um, and then I wanted more pixels, so I moved it to this one. Um, <laughs> so it's not too difficult. So for instance, this, uh, this Tetris here, I can actually basically rotate it and scale it down so it can run sort of landscape on this one. And that's, that's already implemented and the rest of it, um, it wouldn't be too difficult to kind of go back and uh, kind of scale it down or switch, it, wanted switch to play it around with it, a bit. But I didn't have the big matrix. It was throwing me off. <laughs> yeah. So so at the minute, it's not there, but it, it could be like it could be done. Um, yeah. Just don't look too closely into the GitHub because the, the code's a mess. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, but, so yeah, we have space invaders as well. So we've got these barriers that you can obviously shoot. Um, oh, wow. And you can shoot the enemies. And uh, yeah, we don't know how that works. And obviously, if you get shot, you will die. So, did you have to program the whole game uh, besides yeah. the display part of it? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, I so I started from scratch, basically. So, you know, I guess if you've been playing with these, you've seen the GitHub library that allows you to interact with them and basically set the colors of the pixels. Um, so I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's inside the GitHub for this as, as like a linked library. Um, but yeah, so basically you control the pixels um, and then, yeah, using that, I built a C++ application to do all of this. Uh, wow. Yeah, so that's the main stuff. Um, so that's kind of one project. I have a couple of other things, unless you've got yeah. any questions about this. So you can no. ask, like, interrupt at any time. So I'll have to uh, just share my screen because these, I didn't want to like any of these. So let's just see if that work, this works. Oh, uh, no, I'm going to have to. So I think I need to go into system preferences. So it, was, it might not work, but we'll see. I might need to restart my browser. That's the problem. So you got no. started with the Pi stuff back in March, you said, when all this lockdown began. But how long did it take you yeah. to develop this, like the Matrix game project from beginning to end? Um, kind of, I don't know, uh, uh, probably a couple of months just doing it kind of in my spare time. So, um, yeah, so let me just see if this works. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's working or not. Oh, uh, hang on. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is going to work, to be honest. So I'm having uh, permissions issues with the screen sharing. Uh, 
Uh, there's some instructions here. So, I mean, yeah, maybe just I'll, I'll try and sort this out quickly. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, what's I, so which, uh, so just to recap for the audience, which, uh, which hat are you using for that? Is it the, uh, the Adafruit bonnet or the big hat? And, uh, uh it's just the bonnet. Yeah. So I can actually wait, unplug something for a second from the, from here. Oh no. Okay. Uh, we should theoretically be able to both pull this off Avram with what we've got. Yeah, just not with my wire. Uh, um, we can so if I want to screen share, I need to quit Chrome and open it back. Is that worth doing? Or sure. Would that cause issues or anything? Um, but yeah, you can, sorry, sorry, carry on. With what we'll let doing. you back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, okay. I'll just quit now and I'll come back quickly. Good deal. All right, you want to show, you want to show yours? Uh... Yes, yes, we have plenty of things to show off while he's getting that set up. Okay, so. For all of you guys watching that aren't familiar with what we do, once a month we try to gather up, well, we don't try, we succeed. We gather up a list of the best Raspberry Pi projects that we have found. You guys work really hard in the Raspberry Pi community, and we know that it isn't always easy to pull off what might seem like a really simple concept. So what we want to do is recognize your hard work by featuring your projects and sharing them as much as we can. So I've gathered a last, a li bleh, I've gathered a list of 10 for the month of December. And you can go to tomshardware.com to review the complete list. But right now I've got three really interesting projects to give you a taste of what the community has been up to this month. So I'm going to switch my camera here to my screen. Now what you are looking at here is a Raspberry Pi retro Pi rig that is housed inside of an old GameCube. And this was created by a maker named, well, not really named, but his handle is Pollinator1993. I'm a sucker for GameCube stuff, especially this week. I've had my wave bird out playing some GameCube stuff. So I'm probably biased for picking this one first, but this is a really cool project. And just, just to put a disclaimer out there, this was made from a repurposed broken GameCube. So there was no working retro hardware dismantled for this project. So you can, Breathe a sigh of relief if you're worried about a broken GameCube. This is just a retro Pi rig, so you can't really play any GameCube games on it. But I just, I really like this setup. I think it's cool how people put Raspberry Pis into almost anything. And like I said, I'm biased towards the GameCube. And it, it's just, it's just a cool project. He had to 3D print a bunch of components to house everything inside. Uh, the original controller ports have been converted into USB ports, so you can plug your USB controllers in and there are LEDs that turn on when it's working and there's even a, a touch screen. You have to check this project out if you're into GameCube stuff because it's just, it's just too cool. Now, the next one I had to show off. This one is really fun if you're into aerospace. It was developed by a team at NASA. It's a Raspberry Pi robotic ISS model and it uses a Raspberry Pi to operate a small scale replica of the International Space Station and it uses 12 motors total to it just basically it moves it in real time if a solar panel or a thermal radiator moves on the actual iss the raspberry pi will respond and just move the model accordingly in real time and it's just it's really cool if you're into aerospace i'm a sucker for aerospace and if you are too you should check out the list because there's another cool project that nasa has been working on involving the raspberry pi now the last one i wanted to show off let's see here this is a Raspberry Pi 400 mod, and it uses um, it uses a Raspberry Pi 400 that was totally taken apart, and they replaced the keys with mechanical keys, and it was created by a maker who goes by the name of Spencer Online. I love this project because it just completely changes the design of the Raspberry Pi 400, and it was also one of the first mods that we encountered after it was released, which leads me to a question for you, Avram, I'm not sure if our buddy is back yet, but have you seen any cool Raspberry Pi 400 mods, or do you have any ideas for some that you would like to see? Hmm. Uh, so Nathan is back. Have I seen any? Mm, you know, I that's the coolest I've seen. I'd like to see somebody put what I'd like to see. I'd like to see somebody put a track point, a... Uh, or equivalent pointing stick between the G and H keys. So yep. <laughs> you have your pointing device right there. 
Uh, and I would like it to be a mechanical keyboard too. Uh, so that, so that is cool. Uh, I, uh, I pulled out cause I don't know if Nathan's I think is in use right now and yours is in use. I pulled out just to show everybody. So the back of one of these led matrices. So this is a 64 by 32 led matrix that I have here. Um, and you can see that there's a, there's a standard cable that goes into it and then there's the power and right here i have a raspberry pi zero w with the uh, add a fruit bonnet which is like the i think the gold standard for controlling the eastern raspberry pi and it has you know the ribbon cable and it's got the power uh going into two screw terminals uh and it requires its own power source which they recommend uh a five volt, four amp power source. So, um, so I have a power supply, which is what I have to yank it out of. And uh, Adafruit has some really great uh, Python libraries and, and other libraries that you you can use for this. Um, so, Nathan, did you base your stuff off of the Adafruit libraries? Uh, yeah, I mean, I assume it's an Adafruit library. Um, but yeah, it just lets you interact with the pixels so like set the pixel colors um and do some other stuff so you can like scroll text as well um with the library i think there's like python and c plus plus support maybe some others I'm not uh, sure. someone asks someone asks can it run crisis only uh, on, only on the pi zero <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no it can't <laughs> so what so what is it you were gonna what were you gonna show um, yeah so let's see if it works now um so, we'll, fingers crossed. It looks like it's doing something. Can uh -huh. you see that? I'm not sure what's going yes. on. Yeah, yes. okay. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, that was kind of the main project. And then I've got a couple of other things that I've done. So, the first one of these is, um, hang on. Okay. So, um, yeah, so on like a completely unrelated thing, I, I wanted to try and build um, an emulator. So, I was thinking like an NES or a Game Boy emulator. So I did some Googling and it turns out um, kind of a good first emulator to build is this um, really simple system called a Chip 8. Um, and this this is like a virtual machine from like the 70s or something, but it only has 32 by 64 pixels. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, well, I, you know, I know the perfect display device for something with 32 by 64 pixels. So um, I basically wrote this Chip 8 emulator, which runs on um, this matrix here. So this is like a ROM. So obviously that was Pong there. So it's quite a short video. Um, so I didn't write all of these games, but I wrote the emulator. So that means I can just load up ROMs and then it can play the different games, um, basically. So this is Breakout. Um, and yeah, you can see, so I'm trying to basically, I'm struggling to find which, uh, keys map to which controls, um, basically because there's, there's 16 keys on the chip eight um, and none of the games map them use the same keys apparently. So here I really struggled. I was trying to find out how to control snake basically as I was playing. Um, yeah. So that's, that's that kind of little sub project. That's uh, awesome. Good work. Yeah. So, so yeah, in theory I can load up different ROMs Although, So I was going to kind of make like a menu system where you could like select the games and then play with the controller. But, the inputs are kind of difficult because there's too many buttons to map to this controller. Um, so I haven't really taken it too much further yet. And then I've got the last thing is basically uh, this painting application. That's what I wanted um, to see. Yeah, so yeah, this I I was gonna try and live demo, but I think it's trying to get an iPad and the matrix on camera at one time. So I actually try and um, draw the Raspberry Pi logo here. You can. <laughs> the judges of how successful that was so um yeah you can control kind of the color with these sliders here so we've got like rgb sliders and the size of the kind of brush um and then yeah you can paint on this ipad so this is my old ipad and it's got like a 64 by 64 grid of kind of um buttons basically and then they map obviously like a one-to-one -one mapping to the pixels on the matrix um and then there's like a server running on the raspberry pi uh, which communicates with the iPad over my local network, um, which is how kind of the data gets from the iPad to the uh, Raspberry Pi. 
So is that an app or is that actually, I'm sorry if you hear the train in the background, um, is that an app that you're running on the iPad that you made or is it through a web browser? Uh, no, so this is actually an app. Um, so one of the, yeah, one of the good suggestions that I got from Reddit was to make a web app, which I don't know how to do yet, but it'd probably be better for like compatibility and stuff like that. But yeah, that's just a quick kind of iOS app that I sort of um, uh, just kind of quickly rustled up kind of thing. What did you throw it together um, with? The app, I mean. The app? Uh, so I used Xcode, um, which is like Apple's kind of uh, sort of proprietary program for developing iOS apps. Cool. So I'm not sure if you could do it in anything else, but um, that's what I used. So yeah, here I draw like a smiley face. Um, so this kind of flickering, this is like an artifact of the camera, so you don't see this in real life. Um, and obviously the colors kind of look much better in real life as well. They're quite washed out. Um, but yeah, these matrix, matrices do look really cool in person. Oh, definitely. I found that whenever I put the one up behind me for it to look best on the camera, I had to go in and adjust the color to be like 50% darker. Otherwise it was so washed out with light, you couldn't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I should have done that, but... Um, it just takes experimenting. Yeah, yeah. Depends on your yeah, camera. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just my phone, which I'm holding with my hands. <laughs> it's it's very shaky and not great quality. But yeah, that's oh, that's, that's great. great. So I'm just putting up for people who are watching uh, the address of your GitHub, which is uh, GitHub slash zcqsntr. So uh, yeah, where you can find all this stuff. Uh, yeah, all of all of the repos are a mess at the minute. So. Uh, don't be too harsh. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of uh, stops to share my screen. But yeah, there is kind of a work in progress at the minute. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's that's really awesome. I mean, it, it's I'm just uh, it's it's amazing. I would love to do the I would love to do the painting thing. That's that's got to be tough though because you're not in the app store, right? So someone would have to use. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's not in the app store. So um, I, I'm not even sure how you do that. I guess you can pull the repository and try and get it to run. But I think you would run into problems with like the licensing because it's tied to my account. Yeah, um, yeah Apple makes it Apple makes it difficult. Yeah. So that's why a web app would be probably a much better idea. Yeah, that, that would be cool or a way of actually doing it on another Pi. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but that 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 is so that is so awesome. I'm, I'm curious, where did you get your uh, your your matrices? I know did you get them from Adafruit? Did you get them? Uh, there's a lot that are really inexpensive if you buy them on like, you know, one of those sites like AliExpress or Banggood. Yeah, I got them from um, Pi Maroney. So they, they seem to be about, um, so there's, I, I don't think we can buy directly from Adafruit in the UK. I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you can, but um, so there's like Pi Hut and Pi Maroney and Pi Maroney were just cheaper. So I just got them from there. Oh yes, I just got like a hundred more than a hundred dollars worth of uh, stuff from Pimeroni uh, yesterday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's easily done. Like <laughs> I had to pay to have it shipped over here, over here to New York, but but I do I just, because their stuff is so it's so great. We've had them on we've had them on the show. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's like a constant temptation, and and they had a really big sale for for Cyber Monday. So I don't know yeah. if that's I don't know if that's still going as we're talking, but wow, so many hats. Uh, yeah, it's easily done. Easily. Just a second ago, I got an email saying a Raspberry Pi I bought yesterday was shipped. I'm like, oh, all right, I'm ready for that. To come in. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to ask. We have to ask Nathan the question we ask all of, all of our guests, except I wouldn't ask Evan Upton this because it seemed like a weird question for him. <laughs> How many Raspberry Pis do you have? Uh, yeah, so I have four. So I have one one in that. Um, one for my 3D printer. Uh, so I have one in this. Um, so I'm trying to make like a sort of emulator console. So at the minute, I've just done all the wiring and haven't. That's beautiful. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, that's very nice of you to say. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so there's a Pi Zero in there. And then um, I have a Pi 3, 3A as well, which I want to make basically a better version of that, that emulator console. Um, just a zero, not a zero W in that handheld? Oh yeah, zero W. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that makes a big yeah. difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe so, we should ask Evan. I wonder what he would say. Yeah, but like you know, to all the ones he has at the office. And next time we have him on, we'll we'll ask him. <laughs> you know, it's uh, 
So speak, speaking of speaking of hats, while while we're talking, uh, I, I I have been playing. I had gotten one of the featured products from a few weeks ago, the Braincraft hat, and had done some cool things with it. I figured I would show on the show. Um, so here we have. I'm going to take the. So it's going to talk. So uh, that's why I'm going to. Once I start. Uh, take the cap off the camera, it's going to start talking. So uh, I got the image, the object, rec the image recognition working on this. And it's weird because it's always telling me that I'm a seatbelt. <laughs> Let's see, is it going to do it again? My seatbelt? Uh, upside down, I got to hold it. Let's see. Uh, well, now it's being quiet. Let's try something else. Window shade. It says window wow. shade. Window shade. Yes. <laughs> it just keeps weirdly keeps telling me that I'm a seatbelt. Uh, and it flashes it here on the screen, which unfortunately it's hard for me to hold it a good angle while keeping it plugged in. So it looks kind of, uh, si uh, looks kind of like sideways for people. But this hat is pretty cool. Um, How does the image recognition work? So the image recognition works. Uh, so, you know, let me see if I can do a screen share to show the, the terminal here. Uh, okay. It's going to look okay. So share the screen. So this is, I'm sure this is really easy to see. Okay. So this is the, um, this is, I guess it is, it's not great when you have a 4k screen. Um, so this is the terminal for it, right? And what's going on here is that it's running uh, a it's running a Python that they've provided called um, that uses TF Lite, and here it's kind of just spitting out in the terminal what it sees and the amount of FPS that it's getting, which is actually pretty good at 10 FPS. I'm using a Pi Four one gigabyte here, uh, although. I have to say that the model, the default model here, I think we should do better with training it, says keep seeing all kinds of weird things. Like if, I don't know if you can, it's not easily visible here, but it says dishwasher, television, screen. Oh, it's television, it could be. It could see something as a television, but there's no dishwasher here in my home office, I promise you that. <laughs> um, the other thing that I have set up on it that is kind of cool that I wanted to show is that it, it and you could do this uh, elsewhere as well. I'm sure. Do I have to? Um, I'm in a virtual environment, so I might have to. Okay. That I have a. Um, I have a little um, script here to do uh, to turn this into a Google Assistant. So it. Where where is it? Of course, while I'm trying to show it to you. Run assistant. This is this is not very good to look at. So I think I'm going to just show you the output, the outcome of it. Um, so when you run that, what happens is it it then causes uh, these lights to light up red, um, which means that it's not listening. Now this is interesting because it's different than a regular Google Assistant that has a wake word. In this case, you press a button and then you can ask it. You know, questions like here. I press. What time is it? It's two fifty eight p.m. So, you you do this. You ask it questions, and then it's just like regular Google Assistant. Um, now, the the Braincraft hat doesn't come with speakers. Uh, you can use any kind of speaker you want, but it has outputs, particularly for these uh, speakers that have like two pin. JST connectors, so I got a pair of those for eight dollars. Um, so it's uh, it's it's kind of neat. I mean, I think the next step for this is that what my son would really like to do, and we've been having a little bit of a hard time getting this to work well, is get this to actually do custom voice recognition. We were trying to work with a library called Respeaker that we've we've seen uh, promoted. That's for offline speech recognition. It seemed really slow, though. Like it would, you know, pause for like a second before um, before measuring it. We'd love to fix it so that we could tie this into stuff so that it would 
like control a robot or something like that based on speech. Um, maybe even maybe even control this based on based on speech. So, you know, it's uh, it, it's an it's an interesting an interesting tool. It's an interesting concept, and uh, somewhat of a piece of breaking news I should mention about Adafruit is that they posted on their blog yesterday uh, that they are working on their own USB accelerator, USB uh, USB uh, accelerator, AI accelerator for the Raspberry Pi. They're going to use Google's, uh, Google's technology, the same one you can get in the Coral TPU. So it's going to be another thing like that, but it's going to be on a stick um, that on a stick that you plug in uh, the coral, I think it's a wire, um, but, and they're shooting, I think, to get it to be a little bit less expensive than what, than what Google has. Uh, that would be a big factor. Yes. Uh, oh, we got some interesting uh, questions. To get into Raspberry Pi, is C++ the language of choice to learn? Hmm, I think that's a matter of, of opinion. Um, my opinion is Python. Python too. Uh, because yeah. a lot of things are in Python. What, what do you think? Uh, uh, yeah, I would say, also say Python. So Python's uh, the main language that I use kind of in research. And I did this in C++ basically to get some practice at C++ and also just because it's faster. Um, Cause I did, I did want to run it on a Pi Zero, but it turns out even with C++, it doesn't run very well. So um, it wasn't quite fast enough in the end. Yeah, I mean, Python is I think easier to use than, sure, uh, yeah. than C++. It's also not, not compiled. So you yeah. can, you can just see your changes and work more quickly. Uh, there's a lot of tutorials for it. Uh, Raspberry Pi comes with uh, with a couple of Python uh, development environments on it. Uh, so yeah, I think Python is is the obvious answer. Uh, but I see a lot of the stuff from Matrixes being developed in C plus plus. But most other things I see are in, are in Python. Yeah, so I have Matrixes in Python. So I actually that Snake game I actually wrote it in Python first. And even to port it from Python to C++ took way longer than it did for me to just write it from scratch in Python. I mean, that's partly good because I'm better at Python, but it's also because everything just takes longer in C++. Yeah, I mean, the one thing the one thing about Python that is annoying, but for those who developed in other languages is the, in, I know people who really like it are gonna, gonna take issue and that's okay, uh, is the indenting drives me crazy the indenting drives me crazy that you have to have everything that's like within a loop has to be indented exactly the same amount so i'm constantly getting those errors where like oh your thing is your line of code is one space away uh from being indented correctly i, I wish that the existing ids would help you with that better but that's that's the nature of it uh, i will say this it's fairly easy to use to learn python my eight-year-old uh, is writing code in Python uh, all the time, so uh, so which doesn't mean that it's not complex. You can you can do a lot with it. So that's my uh, that's my two my two cents on this on this matter. <laughs> but uh, the um, anyway, uh, a good question though. There's it, a lot of people that don't know a, where to that's start. That's a from. really good. That's a really good question. Someone else has a, has a good question. Does the R Raspberry Pi integrate with PLCs very easily? Uh, PLCs. I don't. I don't know what. Uh, Monster. Uh, forgive my ignorance. What do you mean by PLC? We'll see if we'll see if they uh, if they type it. Um, I have to, Google says programmable logic controller. Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with this. Yeah. Never used one of those. Probably, probably yes, because somebody has found a way to make every single thing work with Raspberry Pi. The beauty of the beauty of Raspberry Pi is the community. The community is so fantastic that it makes everything happen. And so, if you've thought of it, 
doing something with a Raspberry Pi, there's a good chance that somebody else has already attempted to do it uh, and succeeded. And that is why every time I see an article, uh, like I saw one the other day, saying that some other company is coming out with a Raspberry Pi killer, uh, I grimace because you, even if you make something that has a more powerful processor or something like that, it's not going to, it might find a niche, but it's not going to replace a Raspberry Pi unless it can get, you know, like 2 million, you know, mil 2 million people on Reddit to sign up for, for a subreddit for it and things like that. And, and that community and ecosystem of accessories is, is why nothing can beat the pie. So, uh, so that, that is all the time we have for our show today, but I really wanted to thank Nathan for coming. Thank you so thank you so much. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. It was fun. And and uh, I really encourage people to check out his GitHub, which is again at github.com slash zcqsntr uh, to see how you can do all these fantastic things with LED matrixes. And of course we will be on again we'll be on again next week at two thirty Eastern, seven thirty British time. We'll see you next time. Bye. Therapy Square.